Hello and welcome to Crime Divers. I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. Join us this week while we dive into the story of the Devil's Daughter. Hello and welcome back. Here we are again. Thanks for joining us. Yes. Today, as Laura said, we are going to dive into the case of the devil's daughter. Mm, this one sounds interesting. Yeah, I'm not quite sure it's going to be that long though, so I don't know if it might be shorter than usual, but, but let's, should we just dive in? Let's. Okay. Sharon Carr was born on the 21st of December 1979 in Belize, which is a tiny country on the western edge of the Caribbean Sea, lo- located in Central America. I didn't know where it was, so I had to look it up. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Never heard of that. No. It was a, it was poverty-stricken. It, it wasn't a great p- place to live. Um, her, her dad was a violent drunk, and her mum had an explosive temper. Oh, her parents split up. Surprise, surprise. I was going to say, that's probably a given. Yeah. And our mum met an Englishman and they moved to Camberley in Surrey, which is in England. So, I don't actually know how old Sharon was when they moved. Um, because this story sort of starts when she was 11, so I'm right. not sure, like, if she was doing, what, what she was like before that. Yeah, alright, okay. Um, so, like, well, at first things went well. And Sharon started school and she was doing good. Mm-hmm. So one teacher even described her as charming and refreshing. She played on the basketball team and she had friends, but suddenly she started to change and she became aggressive in class. At 11, she started smoking cannabis around the Dean estate where she lived. Oh dear, that does not sound good. No, um, I'm just thinking like, at 11, how on earth do you get a hold of cannabis when you're 11? I know. I mean, if people are dealing to to 11-year-olds, that is really bad. I know, but I think, like, now, and I mean, in this day and age, I think things like that are quite rife around kids at that age. Well, I wouldn't know because... I just wouldn't know. (laughs) I don't know any kids of that age and whether they're on drugs or not, so... Yeah, well, uh, I have friends who have kids around that age that tell me stories about stuff that that goes on in the schools and stuff, so it it clearly is about... um, It's... I, I, see, I, I like, and I, I did read something about because at eleven your your brain's not fully developed yet. So mm. if you're smoking cannabis, that can affect you later on in life. Well, yeah, exactly. You know, so I mean, not great to be smoking cannabis no, no, at eleven. Not. All right, you know. Well, definitely not. No, I wouldn't. I would hate to imagine that. So, our mum split up with Sharon's stepdad, and like as I said before, like our mum had an explosive temper. Mm-hmm. And when he had told her that it was over, she poured boiling fat over him. Oh, and God. Sharon watched it happen. Well, that's horrible. Yeah, but Sharon watched it happen and she didn't even flinch. Like, what, like she'd kind of Just used didn't to bother it? her. I don't know if if, if she didn't have, just didn't have emotions. Because then again, like, when you're that young, maybe you're not, you're not, you've got mm. emotions, but they're, they're not fully then developed. Maybe, maybe she's just grown up with that. Well, like that, maybe not that extreme, but I mean, there may be something along those lines that's happened before. So well, yeah, just... I think she's grown up with violence. Yeah. So I think that's... It's not phased her, basically. It's not phased her, but... Phew, if that's not going to phase her, then she must have seen a lot of bad stuff. Well, yeah, because that must be quite horrific. I mean... Yeah. I, mean, I, I think it's sore when, like, sometimes, like, you're you're cooking and a bit of oil just splashes oh, at you. I and hate that's, frying stuff. Yeah. I hate frying. So to have something actually poured over you... That must be horrendous. That would be I don't know what excruciating <clears throat> pain. Yeah, I don't know what his injuries were, like how long lasting they were right, or anything, okay. but that's what she did. Yeah. So Sharon's mum, she was part of the voodoo culture and Sharon grew up believing that this had power and that it would aff- it could affect her life. So she picked up like these superstitions and rituals and she believed that she could gain power over other people by performing rituals of slaughtering animals. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if you know, but like most killers or serial killers anyway, like can they start off small, they start off like killing animals and then what, just to progress. sort of test out what they that's can do. Kind of, that's a kind of thing. Right, know, okay. So. Oh no, I didn't know that. That's, that's um, not nice. <laughs> so like pets would go missing like round the the neighbourhood pets would go missing mm-hmm. and Sharon's next door 
neighbour's dog was decapitated oh, with a spade. Oh, no. So, but I'm not sure she actually admitted that, but she was definitely, like, the prime suspect. Right, yeah, okay. And also there was a suggestion, so I'm not sure if it's actually true, Mm -hmm. but there was a suggestion from a friend that she had fried live hamsters. Oh, my God, no. I really hope that's not true. I hope that is not true, because that's... that's, that's... No, like, I just can't get my head around that one. I mean... It's just the fact that it says there was a suggestion from a friend. I mean, if it had just been a suggestion on the internet, like, yeah. oh, I think she'd done this. But the fact that it, it came from a friend, like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm I, surprised I'm she had that. any friends with what she's been yeah. doing. Well, she's got to have friends because she gets her drugs with somebody. But that doesn't mean they're friends, though. No, but <laughs> she's probably got more acquaintances that are scared of her. Yeah. yeah rather than true, actual but... friends. Oh, no, um, that's what a shame for the poor hamsters. That's not, we'll just say that's not true, right? In our heads, that's not true. Okay. (laughs) But it might be. It might be, but not in our heads. In our heads, right? It's out of our heads now. We've forgotten about it. I had a pet hamster, but I didn't like my hamster, but I wouldn't want it to be fried. (laughs) It bit me, so it hurt me. (laughs) And I fell out with it, but I wouldn't want it to be fried. That's No, you you wouldn't want it to be fried. I fall out with my dog all the time. I wouldn't want to fry her. Mind you, she'd be a bit too big to stick in a frying pan. (laughs) But, you know. Yeah. No, that's that's horrific. No, I'm an animal lover. Anyway, I thought I just said we were to forget about the hamster. I know, but I just wanted to say that. Get out your head. Out. Okay. Out. Right, it's gone. Out. It's gone. So, even though she was young, people were scared of Sharon. Obviously. Well, yeah, that could sounds like they would be. <laughs> she didn't have the parental discipline that she should have had, and she was allowed to roam free and pretty do, do pretty much whatever she wanted. Mm-hmm. She had a reputation, and she had realised at a very young age that she was pretty much alone. And she had to stand on her own two feet and be pretty tough Mm -hmm. to survive the environment that she was in. Yeah. So, in June 1992, at the age of 12, she had progressed from animals to humans. Her first victim, be a... Well, her victim, sorry. Do you know, I was actually thinking that this girl was actually the victim at the start here. and I'm Uh, I'm slowly realising she's obviously ah, not. I suppose, yeah, because she was, like, grown up in a... Yeah, no, because I thought that's where we were kind of heading here, but no, she's not the victim. victim. Okay. No, her victim was an 18-year-old hairdresser, um, Katie Ratcliffe, which, she was, Sharon was 12, and she killed an 18-year-old. So... Wow, was she, she must have been quite able to overpower, or, I mean, well, does, are you going to describe how she's killed her? Well, so maybe that might explain. <laughs> okay. You finished? Yes. <laughs> so Katie was bubbly, she had lots of friends, and she was the complete opposite to Sharon. Um, but I'll just, I, I, I've just got to say that she doesn't know her. Oh, right, so she doesn't know her at all. She doesn't know her, no. This was just a total random Yeah, so victim. on the 6th of June, 1992, Katie and her best friend went out to a nightclub in Camberley called Ragamuffins. Katie had just split up with her boyfriend, so she also just needed cheering up, what a night out with her As you do. friend, yeah. Unfortunately, though, she never made it home. So, after the the club closed, I'm not sure what happened to Katie's friend. It doesn't doesn't explain right. where she disappeared to, but maybe Katie they went was off. alone. Actually, maybe they went off their separate ways. or Yeah, which is a bit weird, I'm sorry, but if you go out, you'd never leave your friends. Like, Oh, no, you'd at least walk home. Walk home, get a taxi home, yeah. you know, drop each other off. You, do, you just don't leave your friends. That's... No, but it does happen. But you shouldn't. I know you shouldn't. You shouldn't but look after it, each other. It does happen. People get murdered. Yes. Um. So she she got into a car with Sharon Carr. Oh, oh, no, a car. She got into a car with Sharon Carr. Well, let me finish. Okay. And apparently two males. All oh, right. So it's never been proved who the males were. So I don't know if maybe Kate, Katie maybe knew the boys, and that's why she got in the car. Or because, maybe she was just drunk and they stopped and offered her Well, yeah, her I mean, because as I said before, like, Sharon didn't know um, Katie. They d- they'd never met each other. They didn't know each other. So I'm not sure why she got in the car. She might have just been hitching a lift and yeah. it just happened to be her. Or as I said, she might have known the bot. The so do we know boys. why Sharon was in the car with these boys? Is it? No. No. So were they her, like, drug dealers or something? <laughs> Maybe it could be some eyes. I don't know, but it's a bit strange for... Because obviously if they were old enough to drive, yeah. then it's a bit strange that, the, that they were a 12-year-old. Well, yeah, because that's why I'm wondering. Maybe there's something to do with yeah. that. Yeah. As I was saying, that this story, whereas, like, we've got details, but we've not got that many details, you know? It's, it doesn't go, like, right into it. Yeah. So 
I can, as I said, yeah, as I've we, said before, I can only tell you what, yeah, what is out there. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the next morning, which was the seventh of June, nineteen ninety two, Katie's half naked body was found at seven a.m. in Farnborough, which is three miles away from the club. Right. A frenzied attack had been carried out on her. And she had been stabbed and slashed approximately 30 times. Oh, wow. All over her body. She had multiple stab wounds to her breasts, vagina and anus, which led to speculation that she was raped. But it, la- but it was later said that she wasn't, but because of the injuries, Yeah, and initially that's what yeah, they were, that's they were what thinking. They thought. Yeah. So I'm just pointing that out because, because of that, they thought it was a male yeah. who had done it. It was like a sexual assault. Yeah. So... Hampshire police were doing all they all they could. I mean, apparently they, you know, they were really they did a good job. You know, yeah. you know how sometimes the police mess up. Well, apparently they did. Yeah, the thorough really. investigation was done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So they were doing all they could to find the murderer, but there was nothing to suggest that it had been a girl that right. killed Katie be- because it had been such a frenzied attack, mm-hmm. and it's the sexual nature of it. Yeah. It pointed to it being an adult male. Mm-hmm. So there's no way were they looking at for a twelve year old girl. Yeah. 11 year old 11 year old sorry was she 11 or 12 11 I thought you said 12 no oh was she 12 by now maybe oh yeah by the age of 12 sorry we started off at her being 11 when she started going downhill at 11 she's 12 now well done you're actually listening I was well I do listen (laughs) Um, so according to a documentary that I watched when women kill we see them use just enough violence to get to get the job done like they, they wouldn't usually any more than they need to yeah they wouldn't wouldn't no, normally go into overkill and carry out such a brutal attack mm-hmm. and they wouldn't usually mutilate the victim's body either right. you know it's usually just like a stab wound or yeah whatever, a gunshot as I wound. said whatever it takes to get the yeah. job done it's not over, overkill yeah so again why the police were looking for a male yeah, an adult male as well because mm-hmm. obviously she's 18 she's an adult yeah was an adult sorry yeah um, so anyway so we're going to jump on the 7th of June 1994 exactly two years after killing Katie Sharon was ready to strike again right so by this point she's 14 mm-hmm. and according to her diary um she wanted to feel the sensation of killing again. Okay, so, so she'd enjoyed it the first time, yeah. so she wanted to do it again. Yeah. So Sharon lured a girl called Amory Clifford to the toilets at school. She asked her to find a pound coin that she had dropped. That was her excuse for getting her <laughs> in the toilets. But yeah. Sharon, because Sharon had such a reputation at school, Amory didn't think it would be a very good idea to refuse yeah. to help her. So basically she did as she was told. You know, yeah, she was probably obviously intimidated yeah. and just thought, I'll I bet, just help yeah. him. Yeah, I better do it. Yeah. So after getting her in the toilet, Sharon stabbed her in the lung with a four-inch knife. And she was actually really lucky that she survived. Oh, so she didn't she kill said, her? Yeah, she survived. Because five girls had gone into the toilets just as Sharon had stabbed Amory. So obviously they raised the alarm straight yeah. away. good. So otherwise she probably would have died. Yeah. But because they got, you know, the alarm was raised so quickly... Um, so this time Sharon wouldn't be getting away with it because well, obviously no. she'd been caught red Witnesses, handed. yeah. Good. So she was found guilty on two counts of actual bodily harm against 13-year-old Amory Clifford and she was sentenced to two years at Billwood Hall Young Offenders Institute. So it was there in the spring of 1996 when Sharon was 16, that she finally admitted that she had killed Katie Ratcliffe. Oh, so I take it at that point, they hadn't had any leads or anything on that one? No, that... I'm, never... Yeah, I, I, mean, I'm, I, I mean, I'm assuming they were still looking for the killer, but as I said, like I'm sure they were, I think they were still looking for a male, yeah. an adult male, so um, she had, you know, they weren't looking at her anyway. Yeah, basically, yeah. So, uh, she admit, so she admitted it. So this is when Sharon's diaries were found, as she had confessed, because um, uh, after she had confessed, the police searched her mum's house. Mm-hmm. And I'll read you some like, extracts from her diary. Okay. So there's one saying, I wish I could kill you again. I promise I would make you suffer more. Oh. Your terrified screams turn me on. 
Mm-hmm. I actually found that was really weird. Not because, well, because obviously she wanted to kill again, but the fact that it says it, it turns me on. Yeah. You're 12. Yeah. Why are you getting turned on? Like, at 12, you're not supposed to be getting turned on. Well, no. You're still, you're still a, a child. You're still a child. I mean, you're probably going through maybe puberty, I guess, at the time. But yeah. you're still, well, you shouldn't really know much about old, it. I don't think I knew... I, well, I don't know, I can't remember. Had we had the, the talk at school? Yeah, because you had that when you were about 10, I think, because I'm sure... Did we? Yeah, I think you were about 10, 10 or 11. I mean, it might change now. So, so you would you would have had the talk. You, you know, you would maybe be going through the stage of puberty, but... Yeah. You're still a child at the end of the day, and you're still... You shouldn't, you're not thinking about, about sex. Well, you shouldn't be. No, I'm, I'm sure we weren't. Well, no, I certainly I'm pretty wasn't. certain I wasn't thinking about stuff. No. I don't, I don't even know that... I think at 12 years old, you, even if you've had the talk about sex, mm-hmm. I'm sure you're not going to know about being turned on and stuff like that. No. You know, you'd maybe think, oh, you have sex to make babies. Yeah. But you're not going to be thinking about the fact that you would get turned on and feel oh. horny and stuff yeah. like that. I don't think... Well, certainly at the age of 12 when I was, that wasn't no, the case. That, I mean, same here. I don't know whether things are a bit different now. <laughs> same. But um, and I don't certainly think, wasn't then. I don't even think now killing somebody would turn me on. No. In fact, I'm pretty sure it would. <laughs> but then that's the weird and crazy twisted minds of killers they have. Yeah. Why do killers always write stuff down, though? I mean, a lot of, I mean, not, no, not every case, but a lot of cases I've heard about, like, they seem to write, is that their way of release? Or, you know, they always seem to write I know. what they've done. Can't answer you there, though, because I've well, never no. killed anybody, so <laughs> I don't know. And I don't write things down. Well, I write things down. Yeah. If I really need to remember something. Yeah, I never. Did you ever keep a diary when you were like younger? Not mm-hmm. obviously to write that kind of things, but yeah, I kept a diary. No, I never. I never kept a diary. It wasn't. It was not for I... long though. No, you probably wrote rubbish in it, didn't you? I know. There, well, there is a reason why I got rid of it, but I don't think it's the podcast is the place for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was to do with a boyfriend. All oh, right. Yeah. It and just yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't want to let's, see your little secret. Let's move on. Um. And then, so that was one extract. So there uh-huh. was another extract that says, I swear I was born to be a murderer. Killing me, killing, sorry, killing for me is a mass turn on and it just makes me so high I never want to come down. To me, that doesn't sound like a 12 year old. Like, I know. Uh, like, talking about, k- k- um, it's a mass turn on and it makes me so high I never want to come down. Like, how, I don't even think I would think that, that's an adult thinking to me. That's not. Yeah, a child. I mean, it's almost like was she like an old head on young shoulders mm. type kind of mind, and had, maybe maybe had she had to grow up because of what she'd witnessed with her mom and dad mm. and stepdad. You know, maybe still doesn't make. I still don't get the turn on. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't get that either, to be honest. But I guess we'll probably not get to know, like, yeah. understand that because we're not in her mind. Thankfully, right. The next one is every night I see the devil in my dreams. Sometimes even in my mirror, but I realise it was just me and my heart of terror. At least she realises that she's evil. Oh, she rhymed that, didn't she? The mirror and terror. Yeah. I never realised that until you just said it. <laughs> That's a bit of a rhyme. Um, another one says, killing is my business and business is good. Yeah, she's weird. And the last one says, I bring the knife into her chest. Her eyes are closing. She is pleading with me. So I bring the knife to her again and again. I don't want to hurt her, but I need to do violence to her. I need to overcome her beauty, her serenity, her security. There there I see her face when she died. I know she feels her life being slowly drawn for her, from her and I hear her gasp. I guess she was trying to breathe. The air stops in the back of her throat. I know all her life her breathing has worked. But it does not now, and I am joyful. No be funny, like, but I mean, if she, if that wasn't, if she wasn't what she was, she could have been a writer. Yeah, I know. Because I was actually thinking for a twelve-year-old, that's, that's pretty impressive. Good I mean, yeah. it's not a nice thing to be writing. No. You know what she's writing about. No. But in the way that she articulates, the way, yeah, the way that she's written that, mm-hmm. she could be a writer mm-hmm. at twelve years old to write that. Yeah. Unbelievable, mm-hmm. isn't it? It's just a pity she couldn't have just written that into like. If it was fiction, a fiction story would be great. Yeah, exactly. Not a real life thing, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I was really surprised reading that. Like, I was like, I can't believe that a child wrote that. What was that. The, the the first extract you read again? Can you read me yeah, that again? The first one. Hang on, just find it. 
I wish I could kill you again. I promise but I see would that. make you suffer so more. She wrote, I wish I could kill you again. But then in that last extract, she said, I didn't want to kill you, but I had to. No, she said she didn't want to hurt her, but I need to do violence oh, right, to okay. you. Right. Just because I thought she was maybe contradicting herself there. No. She's, she's just bas- basically, I think what she's saying, she did, she wanted to, she wanted to kill her, but she didn't want to hurt her while doing it. So, if she, if she wanted to kill her, then she could have done it without hurting her. Well, yeah, I mean... She could have just... As bad as it sounds, ways, but you could have done it a bit less horrific. Yeah, of course. Like that she's not suffering. Yeah, I there mean, is other ways to do it. So, so I don't, but, I don't really... But she get... did say, I, I need to do violence. So she is kind of contradicting herself. She's saying that she doesn't want to hurt her, yeah. but she wants to do violence to her. So is that like a confused, maybe... Because, I mean, at 12 well, years old, I mean, you can be, you, you know, you're not matured at that age. You're She's obviously very confused there. Yeah, bit. I mean, you're like... confused at the best of times when you're grown up, never mind... Well, exactly. ...this as well. So, yeah, it's a, it is a bit kind mm. of confusing, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm not quite sure what she what she wanted as you said like she she didn't want to kill she didn't want to hurt her but she needed to do violence to her so she needed to kill her mm-hmm. and do violence but she didn't want to hurt her so yes yeah, yeah, very a bit strange con- a bit contradictory really. yeah so in, in May 1996 after 27 hours of police interviews Sharon was charged with Katie's murder mm-hmm. uh, she had told the public sorry totally no <laughs> start again she had told the police mm-hmm. she didn't tell the public anything <laughs> she told the police that she had taken Katie's bracelet but that had never been disclosed to the public right so you know it's a case of like Mary Bell again you know it's unless you're there herself. yeah okay yeah she's placing herself there mm-hmm. um, and also she described some of Katie's injuries that hadn't been disclosed right okay so the police knew that she'd yeah. you know so they were she'd definitely done yeah, it she definitely wasn't done just it, yeah. making it up so the two men Two men were believed to be in the car with, Kat, with Sharon and Katie that night, and Sharon actually did name them. Right. But they were questioned, and they provided each other with an alibi. So... But how can they provide each other with an alibi if they're I both know, in the car? Uh, well... I mean, if they know they're both there together, then surely well, they should know that they're making that up. Without knowing what they actually said, we can't yeah. really... Obviously, they give it a, a, a good enough... They can, they, the police couldn't disprove it, so... Right, okay. They've obviously given her good enough. Reason. Yeah, but she, I mean, somebody had to be with her because well, she can't drive for a start. Well, yeah, but she can't drive, and there was blood at the murder murder scene, and it indicated that Katie's body had been dragged round a corner. Right. So I find it hard to believe that a twelve year old would be able to drag an eighteen year old's body mm-hmm. because surely she's going to be a dead weight. Yeah. So to be able to drag her round a corner, it's yeah, you take quite a lot of effort. To yeah, that, yeah. So I think so. It, it, it's thought that the police know who helped her so right. whether it is those two boys or not I, uh-huh. I'm not quite sure but would they not have been charged then for but, helping I mean never let me finish sorry well they didn't have enough evidence to prove it in court right so they think they do know yeah but they just they can't basically they've got away with it yeah they can't name them because if they can't prove it in court mm-hmm. then they can't do it can they no they can't charge them no so a few weeks after she was charged on the 7th of June 1996 Sharon's diary entry read Respect to Katie Ratcliffe, four days today, four years today. So, it's like she's still, like... What's like an anniversary to her that she remembers. Yeah, Yeah. I didn't quite know how to to put that in words, but yeah, it's like, it's an anniversary, it's just saying respect to to her. Well, you didn't respect her when you were stabbing her to death, were you? That's... It's a bit of a cheek, isn't it? (laughs) <laughs> so anyway, so while in custody, Sharon retracted her c- confession. So her trial was set for March 1997 when she was 17. So this is like f- actually five years after Katie was killed. So mm-hmm. can you imagine her family not having that sort of closure, like getting the yeah, justice, you know, well, like for five years. Yeah, that's quite so, a long time. Yeah, so the trial lasted for four weeks and the jury heard written and verbal confessions from Sharon and although there was no for forensic evidence, she knew details of the murder mm-hmm. that only the killer could We've have known. known. Yeah. So basically, the jury just had to decide whether she should be convicted of manslaughter or murder. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no trace of remorse. She just seemed cold. And any emotion she did show was probably for herself, not for what she did to Katie and you know, our fa- Katie's family yeah. and friends. 
So the jury, which consisted of seven men and five women, came to the unanimous decision that Sharon Carr was guilty of murder. Good. So, th- yeah. She was sentenced to 14 years in prison, but the judge recommended that she should be detained indefinitely. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, so she's described as being a really, really dangerous psychopathic murderer. Wow. That's, that was, I think that was a policeman, one of the um, police then, you know, that did the yeah. investigation. He, that's what he said. Uh-huh. And the public wouldn't be safe if she was to come out of custody even now. So it's thought that, it, and it's thought that it wouldn't be possible to rehabilitate her. Well, so that's really, how that's bad how she bad. is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so at first she was incarcerated within the prison system, mm-hmm. but she was extremely difficult to manage. And she attacked other prisoners and staff on several occasions. Mm. <coughs> um, so she was transferred a few times between prisons. Yeah. Eventually, she was assessed by mental health pro- professionals, which I just think eventually... I know. She should not have been right Done from the start. start. Yeah. I think she should have. I mean, even when she tried to kill Anne-Marie, uh-huh. she should have been assessed then because like, it's not normal for... What, she was, she was 14 then? Yeah, not normal it's for a 14-year-old. It's not normal year old, for a 14-year-old no. to be stabbing her, class, you know, a school friend. So, yeah. Well, well not, maybe not a friend, not but, a friend, but you know what I mean. A, school, a classmate. Yeah, a classmate. Well, no, she was a year younger, so... Right. A school... A fellow yeah. school pupil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? I don't know why we're... Even, no, that's not... No, that's not relevant. No, not science. really. Not at all. Um, no. So, yeah, so she was assessed by the mental health professionals, mm-hmm. and she was sectioned under the Mental Health Act 1983, and was transferred to Broadmoor Hospital in June 1998, where she was diagnosed with having schizoaffective disorder. Right. So, I know you don't know. Yes, I have no yeah. idea what that is. No, I had to look it up. So, this is a combination of schizophrenia, which is a psychosis, and a mood disorder. So, affective means the mood disorder. Right, So, it's okay. like the two of them together. So, along with delusions, paranoia... Hallucinations that are associated with schizophrenia, Mm -hmm. you either have depression or mania and depression, as in a bipolar disorder. So it's a combination of all that. Uh So there's like a mood disorder, a psychosis, bipolar, it's like all mixed together. Okay. So basically she was very screwed up. Yes, that was a lovely way of putting it. So <laughs> she stayed at Broadmoor Hospital until it changed from being a mixed sex hospital to male. That changed to male only, so she had to move. Move, yeah. And um, so she moved to a different secure hospital in London. So I'm not actually sure if I. I don't think I found out what that was called. I think no, I just said it was in London. Mm-hmm. So Sharon met and fell in love with a fellow inmate, Robbie Lane, because this was obvi- this was a mixed one. Oh, I see. To. No, she wasn't gay. She, right, moved, okay. she moved to a, a, this oh, was a mixed one. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, he had been. He was a lovely fella. He had been convicted of murdering his mum oh. in 1994 when he was 17. Lovely. He had beaten his mum at least 29 times and gouged her eyes out with the handle of a carpet sweeper. He claimed to have murdered murdered his mum out of jealousy, as he believed that she favoured her sister. Wow. <laughs> so, he just sounds like a right delight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that's awful. Like she, he murdered his mum because he thought. Yes. Didn't even know, like he thought that she preferred her daughter yeah. to her son. So anyway, that's you know. This I'm surprised is, they even let it, like people that to, you know have well a relationship. supervised. Um, like, cha- yeah. That th- this is not his story. This is her story. So, Shannon and Robbie got engaged after nine months together right they were allowed to spend time together under supervision supervision right but they weren't allowed sexy time which isn't the actual word <laughs> that's my word sexy time I sexy thought. time yeah they weren't allowed sexy time <laughs> um they had bought wedding rings from argos and we're gonna get mad them um, they got um like somebody like a member of staff to actually go and buy the wedding rings for them all right okay so and they were gonna get married in the hospital but they called off the wedding when they saw a newspaper report about it. So in the newspaper, they were obviously reporting, because like, it's quite a big thing, I think, like two you know, people in this secure hospital getting yeah, married. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So the report contained details of their crimes. Okay. Now, they obviously didn't know, know what each other was even in there for. All right, okay. Because they were so shocked at what each other, each other had done, they split up. 
Really? So, yeah, they could, they wouldn't even talk to each other after that because they were so disgusted with what each other did. But surely they must have known they were in there for a reason. They obviously didn't know the details. <laughs> Well, uh, I would ask. Well, I would. I'm, I'm sorry. If I'm going to marry somebody, then I want to know, especially somebody who's in a, a you know, a, a secure hospital yeah, like under the Mental Health Act, I want to know why they're in there, even though obviously I'm in, under the Mental Health Act. Uh-huh. So I've got my issues. He's got his. Yeah. We should really know what each other's problems are. Well, yeah, I would think so. But they were so disgusted with what each other done. I've got a bit of a cheek to be disgusted. Well, yeah. <laughs> considering they both did quite horrific both, things. At the end of the day, they're both murderers. Yeah. And he murdered his own mother. Well, yeah. And she murdered a stranger. So they're both pretty bad because he murdered somebody who is who he's supposed to love and who loves him unconditionally, blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. And then she murdered somebody who she doesn't even know. Yeah. So that's really bad cold. as well because... Well, cold, isn't it? Cold, There's calculated. no reason for it. Mm-mm. So these two people have killed... killed they, they're murderers in both both horrendous circumstances uh-huh. and they've got the cheek to be disgusted with each other oh. and they call off the wedding and they don't speak to each other anymore. That's actually laughable. Yeah. For that. So that is the end of the story. All right, okay. And I take it they're both still in there then. They must be. <laughs> well, she. I, I'm not, I don't know about his, him because obviously yeah. I didn't really look into his... No. I only looked in, into him with regard to her, so I yeah. don't really know his, his story. Um... But she, yeah, I mean, like that policeman said that um, she would be a danger to the public to be let out even now because she was being detained indefinitely. So I'm assuming yeah. she's still in this in, there, yeah. um, in the secure hospital. Wow, but that's quite bad. Like for to be so young mm-hmm. um, and to 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 actually for them to act, for professionals to actually say she can't be rehabilitated. That yeah. must be quite she must bad. Be pretty bad. Yeah. So, she's, uh, so, I mean, I know she has, um, you know, the schizophrenia and all that stuff, so mm-hmm. but I'm assuming that can't really be managed then with medication for her to be um, not dangerous. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. Don't I, mean, I, don't, I don't really know enough about schizophrenia or, no, or anything I mean, like that. No, I don't um, know, but yeah, she's still she's, but she's still, obviously she's still, still, if she's seen as a danger to the public, then... Uh, then she's better off where she is. Well, then. yeah, by the sounds of it, she clearly is. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but do you know what actually really annoyed me is that they kept saying on this de- this documentary that I watched about her, and they kept saying that she was Britain's youngest killer, mm-hmm. female killer, sorry. Mm-hmm. But Mary Bell was younger than her. And then mm. I looked in the comments, and people were saying, "Oh yeah, but Mary Bell was convicted of manslaughter, right? And she was convicted of murder, right? Okay, Sharon was convicted of murder. So yeah, I get that she was the youngest convicted murderer, right?" But not kill her, because no. Mary Bell still killed. Yeah. So that kept annoying me. I was like, no, I've covered this case. Yeah. Mary she's, Bell is she's the youngest, youngest. Famous, f- famous female <laughs> killer. Yeah. So that annoyed me. Because mm. she was only, well, she was the day before her 11th birthday. Yeah, that she that's right, the yeah. first one, wasn't she? Yeah. And Sharon was 12. Yeah. And she said, and she wasn't, and the, she wasn't the um, youngest murderer either, because you had, um, Jamie, James Bulger's murderers they were I think they, were they 10 or 11 as well but they were males so yeah I'm not actually sure what they got charged but I don't know if that was no, I don't murder know. Or, or manslaughter surely that was murder I would have thought I so I don't know and I'm not looking at that case that is a case that I will not no I don't I will like never do that one that because case. that is way too upsetting and horrendous There's, yeah. I know every case is bad but mm-hmm. for me personally that is not one that you want to do. I think that's probably the worst one for me um that's just a no no. No. I will not be doing that. No. So thank you for listening everybody. And if you want to follow us on Instagram or Twitter, we are crime underscore divers underscore pod. We have a Facebook page which is um Crime Divers Podcast. Yes, we got it right. Yes, I haven't finished yet because we actually do have an email that we never bothered to tell anybody before. Oh yes. So if you want to drop us an email we are crime underscore divers underscore pod at outlook.com. Yes, and I would be interested to hear anybody's comments on our cases so far. Yeah. Or any suggestions of any ones that they would like to hear. Yeah, if anybody has any suggestions of anything. Yeah. We are um, open to suggestion. We are open to anything. Any any suggestions. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you, as I said, you can get in contact with us on any of 
our social media or drop us a, a wee email. Yes, exactly. So thanks for listening and we'll be back next week. Yep, see you later. Bye. Bye.